السلام علیکم ورحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ توحید و سنت ڈاٹ کام بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد للہ رب العالمین والصلاة والسلام على اشرف الانبیاء والمرسلین سیدنا و نبینا محمد و علی آلہ و اصحابہ و ازواجہ و من تبعہم بحسان الى یوم الدین In the previous session we talked about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam after spending almost five years with Halima al-Sa'diyya radiyallahu anha coming back to his mother and then leaving for Medina that was called Yathrib at that time for two reasons number one to visit some of the relatives that they had over there but it looks like the primary object objective was to visit the grave of his father his mother wanted him to see the grave of his father in Medina Munawwara so they went and spent some months over there in Medina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had some memories of that time and one of the things we find in Ibn Sa'ad that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says there was a well over there and I learned swimming during that time in Medina and the reason I mention this is because there is a tafsir called Ruh al-Bayan where they have narrated that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam knew swimming and for a long time I was trying to find out where did he get the opportunity to swim and to learn swimming and then Ibn Sa'ad and Ibn Sa'ad I found this narration where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that I learned it over there but remember these are not ahadith these are books of history that are talking about that part of the history don't take it as a hadith and don't take it as a sunnah because he's learning that in his childhood. After spending a couple of months over there, when they started their journey back to Mecca, just as they left Medina, his mother started getting sick. And her situation started getting very bad. Finally, when they were at a place that was called Al Abwa, she could not continue the journey anymore. There were only three of them Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his mother um, uh, Amina, and there was another woman with them that was called Umm Ayman her real name was Baraka there is a long history behind this great woman also who Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to call her many times my mother because she is the one who really took care of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam after his mother passed away one of the things I may mention about her something that normally people don't realize and they try to see the history of that time with the glasses of our time that really makes no sense we need to wear the right glasses for seeing the right things and we need to put ourselves into that time to understand that history Um Ayman, whom Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to call mother. And you know who she was married to? She was married to Zayd bin Harisa radiyallahu anhu, who was considered the adopted son of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Zayd bin Harisa had a son from Um Ayman, who was Usama bin Zayd radiyallahu anhu. 
So, there would not, the age difference in those days was not a barrier that would stop people from marriage. Anyway, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's mother got very sick. Her situation became very critical. But of course the young person is only six years old and is orphan. He needs the attention of his mother and the mother is really giving him the attention that he deserves and he needs. And therefore, he is very closely attached to his mother and as he sees that his mother is laying down in the middle of the desert, he is trying to talk to her. Initially she was able to talk, but gradually she realized that now she won't be able to do that anymore and she could not continue talking to her son anymore. With that feeling, she had some tears in her eyes and as he's talking to her, she is not responding, so he thought she must be upset with him and the young boy is asking the mother, Ma'am, did I do something wrong? Please forgive me if I have done something wrong and I won't do it. Tell me what wrong I have done. And he's trying to talk and there is no reply from the other side. And then in no time she closed her eyes and he's trying to even now. He's even more surprised that he had never seen his mother doing something like this with him. She would pay full attention to him and she would, respond, she would respond to anything that he would say and here she is not responding at all. Now she has closed her, her eyes. Ma'am, you don't even want to look at me? How come you don't, want, you don't open your eyes? But Um Ayman interrupted and she had to tell, tell this young boy that son, I'm sorry, but you would never be able to talk to your mother again. She have left the world. She have passed away. And here we find that this young person who was an orphan had never seen his father. Now as he is happy that at least he saw the grave of his father, but ending up not only seeing the grave of father, but he has to see the grave of his mother also. Um Ayman took him to Mecca, where his grandfather Abdul Muttalib became his guardian. Two years later, this eight years boy now, has to, he sees his grandfather in the same situation that he had seen his mother two years ago. And Abdul Muttalib also left Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam behind. And now Abu Talib became his guardian, his uncle Abu Talib. And here we find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not keeping this young boy at one place. Born in Mecca, goes to in the clan of Bani Sa'ad with Halima Sa'diya, spending some years over there as he comes back to Mecca. Now the feelings are that this will be his permanent home and permanent residence, but after some months, or less than a year, his mother leaves him, and now he's with his grandfather. After two years, even grandfather leaves him, and now he is with his, with his uncle. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not want Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to feel at any, at any age that he is dependent on certain people. And these are the people who would do everything for him. From that age, he's giving him the lessons that you're, too, you're totally dependent on someone else. And these people, no matter how great they might be, no matter how close to you they might be, but they will leave you. The only one that won't leave you is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why we find that after Nabuwa, the best helper, Khadija radiallahu anha, she leaves, and after some time, his uncle Abu Talib also left. So you can see that how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam go through all of these situations. All of these are preparations to prepare this Prophet of Allah to have that trust, iman, and faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. From the childhood, 
he never got the opportunity to call someone dad and then call him for help. He's out. He doesn't have a father, then he's out of his home, then he loses his mother, he loses the grandfather. He's realizing that everyone in this world can leave the person and if they don't want to leave by choice, it might be by force, but we can never be dependent on people like us. We always need to depend on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we put ourselves and our children in that situation, who will have to suffer and go through these hardships one after another at that young age, a person would never want something like this to happen to us, our souls, or to happen to our children. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows how to raise things, how to raise people. And accordingly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raised him in the most perfect way that was most suitable way for him to be able to carry the message that he was supposed to carry in the future. In other words, a lesson for us might be that when we try to give our children every comfort of their life from their childhood, thinking, oh, once they grow up, then they will have to deal with it themselves. At this time, let me do everything that I can. That's not the right way. Get them used to not fulfilling their desires at that young age. Get them used to know that there is no also in this life as there are yes. And there might be a lot of times when you would hear, have to hear, no, you cannot have this. Let them understand from that young age that this life is not to have these things and is not to just fulfill our desire and do whatever we feel like doing. Let them grow with that feeling. So that in the future, if at any stage of their life, Every day door they knock to, they get the response, sorry, we don't have no work for you, we have no job for you, we have nothing for you. They get used to it, they know that this can be accept, expected from human beings like us. And this is part of this life. Allah raised him that way. As he grew up, now people are giving him such a hard time we cannot even think of those, but as he would think, the situation when he's in the middle of the desert, seeing his mother leaving him. There couldn't be anything worse than that now. They can't take anything that is more important to him than that, uh, having the mother at that time. So he's used to it. He knows these things. He knows this is part of the life. And this is what we need to make sure that our generations know. Hopefully, inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them to have us for long enough that we raise them the right way. But at the same time, after that, when they are in the practical life, and in that life, in that practical life, there will be a lot of times when they will not be able to get what they like to have. That should not just disturb their life and give up. Oh, I can do nothing after this. And the person is just totally, life is going failure after that. And the person is uh, mentally disturbed and uh, not being able to do anything else in his or her life. That is not the way. This is when we become too dependent on our worldly life and on worldly gain. And just having the... Uh, attitude of just getting whatever we like to have, then when the person hears the word no, from whatever, sometime from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that every door starts getting closed on this person. Sometime, of course, from people like us. So the person <coughs> will not have that thing as the most important thing in the life. There will be more important things in the life to achieve. A lot of people, they have a heart attack when they lose their assets. But no heart attack when they see their children losing their iman and faith. 
This is all telling us where the trust is and what do we love in our lives. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is raising this messenger of Allah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam now at the age of eight came back to his mother, his grandfather, uh, his uncle. At the age of eight, as his grandfather passed away, he now was taken care of by his uncle Abu Talib. Abu Talib wasn't a very wealthy person. He had ten children by himself. And now, this is the eleventh person that he has to take care of in the family. And their children, his children were trying to help him also. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from that age started learning how to help in taking care of the raising of the family. And he started doing his share of the work. And the share that he took was that he said, I would take care of the goats and the cattle that we have. Some of the non-Muslim historians, when they wrote, when they started writing about this part of the history, again I would say, they try to wear glasses of today and see the history of that of 1400 years back, thinking that whatever we see with our glasses today and the feelings that we have today is the same feeling that people had in those days and the same understanding people had in those days. No, it's not the same. As I said, we need to understand the history by putting ourselves in their position and their situation and then we will understand the values of different things of the time. So, they started saying, and some of them they even wrote this, that because Abu Talib didn't like his nephew and he considered him a burden on him, therefore he just made him a shepherd of his family. And now he put him out in the jungle with his goats. As if that was humiliating this young boy and just trying to keep him out of the house. Whereas you find that goats, taking care of goats and cattle, those were the honors for them in those days. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he talks about it in Quran, and he talks about these cattle that they used to have, he says, وَلَكُمْ فِيهَا جَمَالٌ حِينَ تُرِيحُونَ وَحِينَ تَسْرَحُونَ You have beauty in them when you take them out in the morning and you bring them back in the evening. That people see, look, these how many kids... Goats these people have, this family has. It was a pride, it was an honor that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you have a beauty in it, you show people, look, these are my goats that I'm taking out now. And now as I'm coming back, you feel good that people will see that, here, this, this is my asset, this is what I have. Just like when we drive a nice car. You feel that, oh, people are watching, mashallah, you have this nice car. That was everything for them, that was the most valuable asset of those days, which many times they don't realize it. So anyway, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam started doing his share of the work. At that age, Abu Talib started seeing things in Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He's only eight then ten years old and he's seeing things in Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that made him realize that this is not just an ordinary boy. There is something very extraordinary with him, something very special with this boy. And there is a hadith in Ibn Asakir, narrated by a Sahabi, whose name was Julhama bin Arfata. He narrates, That when, once I went to Makkah Mukarramah, and their situation was very bad in those days. They had a bad famine in Makkah. It didn't rain for a long time. So he said, I witnessed that people went to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa uncle Abu Talib. And they said to him, that don't you see our situation and the situation of all the people around us? That our cattle are dying. And 
our children are not able to sleep our night crying, no food. Why don't you pray to Allah for us? So, Julhama says, at that time Abu Talib took a young boy with him whose face was shining like a sun. He went by the Kaaba. He made the boy stand by the Kaaba. And then he said to the boy, Now you pray to Allah for rain. So he says that young boy raised his finger and as he raised his finger he started saying some words. He says within minutes we saw all the clouds getting together over there and before the boy put his finger down it was raining in Makkah. So he says I asked people who this boy is? Who is this boy? And they said his name is Muhammad. All they could tell him at that time was what his name was and that he is an orphan. They didn't know anything more about him. But Abu Talib realizing that there is something very special with this boy, he made him make the, make the dua for rain. There is a long poem also that the scholars and historians have narrated of Abu Talib. Part of that poem is وَأَبْيَضُ يُسْتَسْقَ الْغَمَامُ بِوَجْهِهِ His face shines and you see the rain just through his face. That by, which means through his face means by praying to Allah through this boy that Ya Allah because of this boy give us a rain and you get the rain. During that time as Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was growing up, up, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected him from all the evils that were going around in Makkah. Of course, it is the days of Jahiliyyah, the same Jahiliyyah that we normally talk about. People are involved in every evil. You name it, and it's there. Especially the youth. And in fact, Looking at the history, there is no difference between the youths and adults. They are all in the same way. And same directions of the life. Youth every night are having a get together. Where they will have all the evils. Playing music, dancing, drinking, and you name it. Now, no one knows that he will be the future prophet of Allah. He doesn't even know it himself at that time. He's growing up in the same atmosphere. His uncle is not telling him not to do these things. Everyone else is doing it. Something was keeping this boy away from it. He says about himself that only once I thought about seeing what these people were doing. He said, everything that I saw I didn't like, but one day I said to myself, let me go and into their get-togethers, night time, and just see what do these people do over there. In their language, of course this is not what he's saying, but you know the language of those who are involved in those things, they're having a lot of fun. And they're encouraging him also that, why don't you have fun? There is no fun in your life. How are you just spending the life, boring life like this? And I'm sure now you can relate a whole story to this as you hear and we hear these type of words. He says, one day I thought, let me just go and see what these people were doing. On my way I started feeling dizzy. So I said, let me said to myself, let me have a little rest and then I will go. As I sat over there, I went to a deep sleep and could not wake up until the sun was, sunlight was hitting me. He says, the next day, again I said, okay, today I'll go. Yesterday I, I got sick, something happened to me, so let me go today. He said, next day I was going there and again the same thing happened and I started feeling so dizzy that I couldn't continue walking anymore. So I stopped 
on the way for resting and I just fall asleep at the same place. And again, I woke up in the morning. At that time, I realized that something is stopping me from even seeing what's happening over there. And after that, I never even thought of trying to see what these people are doing there. Of course, when a person would see something like this, then would have a feeling of it will be encouraged to do something like that. Now shaitan has some pictures to remind the person of. That you see in this also over there. You saw this also. Now as soon as you stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allahu Akbar, this is what the first thing shaitan will do. will rewind all of those things that we have seen over there. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected him from all of those evils of the days of Jahiriyyah. When he was 12 years old, his uncle Abu Talib was going to Syria for a business trip. And he decided, decided to take his nephew also because of the love that he had for him. He could not keep him away from him. So he wanted to take Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with him. As they were close to Syria before they arrived, they stationed somewhere where there was a church or a place of worship and a person used to stay over there whose name was Buhaira. Very learned person of the previous books. That person was watching this group as it was approaching their station and he was watching from the window. He saw something very surprising. In the beginning he couldn't believe himself so he continued watching and then finally he came to the decision that what he's seeing it really meant to be like that and it's not just a coincidence. And that was he saw a cloud that was moving on top of there that group that caravan that's moving and that cloud is keeping its shadow on a young person there. And wherever that boy goes, the cloud keeps on following the boy to keep the shadow on him. So the shadow is on him continuously. To keep that shadow on him, the cloud is always on top of him. When they're stationed, again, now the cloud is stopped. But now he saw that the tree leaned towards one side to have its shed on, on this boy. So he invited them. And he said, I would like all of you people to come and eat at my place. And he never used to talk to any person. When they went to him, now he doesn't see the cloud. So he said, who's missing from the group? They said, only one young person who is just taking care of our baggage. I said, no. I would like that person to come also. And when he saw Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, someone went to call him. When he saw him coming, again the cloud is following him. So he started asking his uncle about his relationship with the boy. And his uncle used to call him son. So therefore he said, this is my son. You know, normally if you are taking care of an orphan, you don't want to give all the history that, okay, his father have died and I am his uncle. So he said, this is my son. He said, I don't think that. I don't think that you are his father. Then he started telling him that I saw something very special with this boy, therefore I am asking you. And I see all the description that we have in our books fed this boy and according to our description his father must have died he said that's true I'm his uncle <laughs> then he advised him advised his uncle Abu Talib that please don't take him to Syria take him back to Mecca and don't take your son anywhere your nephew anywhere else keep him in Mecca because everyone is looking for him at this time 
and people don't know that he is of Arabs. Once they will realize that now their position will be taken away from them and they are not going to have a prophethood in them anymore, they may try to hurt him. So keep him in Makkah. Don't take him out of there. And Abu Talib right there, he sent him back to Makkah Mukarramah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam now he started spending all of his time in Makkah. During that time, a very important treaty took place in Makkah among some people that was called Hilf al Fudul, the Oath of Al Fudul. The purpose of that was, in those days, of course, they had no government that will be ruling, no laws, there is no court. You just go to the leaders for decisions. And of course, what if the leaders of a community are doing wrong to others? Then what? Normally, of course, if they do it within their community, so if a person has a family or something like that, they will stand for him. Slaves and weak people had no one to stand for them. But especially the outsiders... The travelers had no one to help them. And once it so happened that there was a person whose name was Al-As bin Wa'il, one of the leaders of Quraysh. He bought something from a person, from a traveler that came from out of the town and would not pay him the money for the merchandise that he took from him. And he is after him and that person is after al as bin Wal and he is not paying him. So that person went to other leaders of Quraysh and they would not even hear the complaint that how can you complain against one of the leaders? Don't even say something like this. So now what should the person do? He started making some poems and reciting them. So people of least will hear that this is what al as have done to, them, to him. And at the same time, his purpose was that the people of Makkah will realize that we will, they will be insulted all around as people will start reciting these poems so that someone might help them. But of course, this, this did not affect them and they, no one over there wanted to help. Rasulullah had an uncle whose name was Az-Zubair. When Az-Zubair heard those poems, he realized that the person is oppressed and he said to himself that this is always happening, the same thing. That people are doing wrong, our leaders are doing wrong to these travelers. They just take up their merchandise, they don't pay them for it. And no one can help them. These people just have to cry for some days and go back home. We have to do something about it. We you shouldn't just sit on it like this and just take it. So, he went and he talked to some of the people who were known to be nice people, people with good morals, people who like to help others. He went and talked to them, and they made this treaty that was called Hilf al-Fudul, the Oath of al-Fudul. Where the purpose, the main purpose of it was that they would help the oppressed people, no matter who the oppressor is. And we will stack with this situation of al-As bin Wa'il. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was about 20 years old at that time and he was also part of the one of those members who formed that Hilf al-Fudul. He refined that at that age, he's young. All the other young people are busy with other things in their lives. But at that time, he has so much concern of people in the community and of the oppressed people in the community and he has that habit of helping people that he is taking part in that oath, which simply means now will be having animosity against these worst leaders. Because these will be the main target. But did not, he did not care about that and he took part in that. And then they went to, all of them, they went to Ala As bin Wail and they took the merchandise back of that, uh, from him and gave it back to that person.
As Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is growing up in Makkah, the main trade of Makkah is that the people of Makkah will take their merchandise and go and sell it outside in other countries and then bring the merchandise from there and sell it in Makkah. For that, some people were very wealthy and they had a lot of merchandise to buy and sell. Some used to work for others. There was a very wealthy widow in Mecca who always used to look for people who can do that business for her, take her merchandise. She's a woman. She doesn't want to go out. All there's the days of Jahiliyyah, but she doesn't want to go out by herself on a business trip. So, she would always send someone who would do that for her. When she heard about this young person, only 25 years old, about 24, 25 years old, but she heard about his honesty, his truthfulness, his humbleness, his morals. So she sent a person to him if he would accept to go to take her business karma to Syria for a business. And of course he's looking for some work to do. He's doing some work in the town. So he accepted that. And he took her merchandise to Syria for sale. One of her slaves also accompanied him, whose name was Maysara. On their way, Maysara kept on seeing some very amazing things, surprising things, and things that were unique in this young man. We know, especially at a time when there is no faith in Iman, business is difficult many times to run the business without lying and cheating. And then, without fighting, arguing and cursing. You will have to do these things normally in the business. Sometime you have to show people, I won't take this. You have to deal with me the right way. So you will start showing that you can get angry. You have the strength. You have the power. You can curse. You can shout so that next time he, you will be treated fairly. And when it comes to cheating and lying, normally that's part of the business. It's part of the business whether it's today or if it was in those days. Now you can do that in a modern way, in a professional way you can cheat in those days. Of course, in our time I'm sure they had their own professional ways of cheating people and professional ways of lying and bribing. Some people they are not professional, they just come very up front, they'll cheat you on your face just in a way that people can see it. And some people will do it in such a way that even after being cheated, you are the criminal. And it's nothing new for us to hear see these things. It's something that it can be seen very easily. Maysara found that this young man, he never cheats, he never lies. In fact, when people come to buy from him, he stops the person and tells him, you know, these are the faults in this merchandise. If you like to buy it, buy it with these faults, and if you don't want, then don't buy it. But I'm telling you, this is what it has. Other people are trying to hide the faults of it. And we know, you want to sell your car. Oh, it drives so perfect. Oh, I went with it this, these dis distances. And you don't tell them what happened after that. So, being truthful in business and trade is not that easy.
This is why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, At-Tajir al-Saduq al-Ameen, the truthful and trustworthy businessman will be with Anbiya on the Day of Judgment. This is how great of a status that person will have. Sometimes you see the flyer is a big, something so nice, you go on over there even, as soon as you pick the thing up, it's so tiny, that by looking at the flyer you thought it might be ten times bigger than what you see it there. Anyway, he says, I saw, I, he, this thing he saw that he never lies, he never cheats people. Something. That people thought without it you can never run your business. At the same time, throughout the trip, never saw him cursing at anyone. Never saw him shouting at anyone. Talks very calmly and quietly with every person. In addition to that, Maisara is a slave. And this young man is running the business. But he says, he treats me so nicely, I had never seen that treatment in my life before. People were used to misbehaving with their slaves so badly, that they will just be ordering him by using every curse word before the order and at the end of the order, as we know that how people use the language. This was their habit and their behavior and attitude with their slaves. But this man, most of the time he's doing the work himself, and when he asks Maisara to do something, he's asking him so humbly, so nicely, so politely, that Maisara is surprised. Another thing that Maisara saw and throughout the trip is the same thing that that priest seen and that was he saw the cloud following Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when Maisara came back he informed Khadija of all of these things and the Prophet when they came back the Prophet was double than anyone else would have So when they came back and she informed Khadija of all of these things, she became interested in Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And she offered to marry him. There was a woman at that time, she became a sahabiya later on, Khawla bint Hakim radiallahu anha. She was the one who approached Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on behalf of uh, Khadija. So anyway, Khadija radiallahu anha sent the message to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam agreed to that, keeping in mind Khadija radiallahu anha was 15 years older than Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at that time. He was about 25 years old and she was 40 years old. And she was a widow who had two of her husbands passed away. One husband passed away, she got married to another person and that person passed away and now this will be the third marriage for her and the first marriage for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he lived with her for 25 years. So, the time when she passed away, she was 65 years old. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam never married anyone else during that period. When people try to look at how many wives he had, they don't see that up to the age of 53, he had only one. And that was Khadija radiallahu anha. And after 53 is not the age when a person would think of having too many wives. A person who really wants to have those many, 
will have it at young age. And especially in the community, in the society, where having more than one, having hundreds of slave women, was not considered to, an evil, to be an evil. In fact, it was a sign of greatness and a pride. But at that time, he did not go for any of those. It was only when he was instructed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you find purposes behind those. Which, of course, we don't want to get into it at this time. So he got married to Khadija radiallahu anha, who we know was the first believer who believed in Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the first believer in this ummah. And one of the best supporters of Islam and of Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at a time when he was really in need of help and support. And a wife who never complained about her husband that she don't spend the time with me. Now after you got the Nabuwa, you don't have time to stay home. You are always here and there. You are always busy in da'wah. Night time you are standing up so much that your feet are swollen. No complaints. She is helping him with that. And because of that help that she gave and provided to her husband, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, she got the salam from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when Jibreel alayhi salam came especially for this purpose that Ya Rasulullah I came today because Allah sent salam to Khadija radiallahu anha. And he guarantees Allah says that I have kept a special part of the Jannah for you. Of course if she was chosen to be the wife and the first wife of that greatest prophet of Allah and the first believer of the ummah of this ummah that was the chosen ummah by Allah. And if she was chosen to be the first great supporter of this deen and of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then that speaks by itself of her level and status in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, with the exception of one, he had all of his children from Khadija radiallahu anha. He had six children from Khadija radiallahu anha. And the seventh boy that he had, Ibrahim radiallahu anhu, was from Maria al-Qibtiyah radiallahu anha. So he had four daughters and two boys from Khadija radiallahu anha. All together he had seven children. Before the Nabuwa, about five years before that, when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was about 35 years old, that was the time when the people of Quraysh were reconstructing the Kaaba. There are different reasons for that, whatever the reason might be one of the reasons some of the histories mention is that there was a woman that was burning the Bakhur, you know, the perfume that uh, the wood that they uh, burn and they get the smell, uh, the fragrance from it. And the cover of the Kaaba caught the fire and the Kaaba was burned down. And there are some other reasons also in the history. Whatever the reason was, they were reconstructing the Kaaba. And it was an honor for them to be able to construct the Kaaba, to take part in building the Kaaba. There were four major clans of Quraysh, and they divided the work among themselves. But now, after building those walls of the Kaaba, it was the time to pull, put the black stone in its place. And they knew, as they heard the history from Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, that this stone is from Jannah, and it's really an honor for the person who would put that stone in its place. So who would do that? Each clan wants their leader to be the one who would put it there. So that they will have that honor for themselves. 
It went to the extent that they were about to have a war for that. And in those days, when they would have some very important wars, and a war where they would commit themselves to it that either we won, either we get it, or we will just give our lives for it. They used to get a pot with some blood in it and dip their hands into that pot saying, simply means that either we will keep shed our blood, give our blood, or we will have this. So, they did all of this and all four clans, they got that pot and they dipped their hand in the blood. So some of the wise people among them, older people over there, they saw that these people are going to just kill each other for this now. So what type of honor is that where you kill your own people for it? So they said, why don't we, we just come to some solution, have some type of understanding of it, and have someone to make a decision. Okay, how to do this? So as they are sitting by the Kaaba, they said, okay, if all four leaders agree, then while we are sitting here, before anyone leaves, no one is allowed to leave anymore, and the first person that will enter from this door of the uh, haram, that will be the person who would make the decision. And every clan should accept his decision. They said, fine. And instead of killing our own people, let's do that. They all sit over there watching, and here, the first person that was sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And as soon as they saw him, they started calling As-Sadiq al-Ameen, Radina, Radina, yes we are pleased with his decision, whatever decision he will make, because he is the most truthful and the most trustworthy person in Makkah, if whatever he will say will be good for all of us. Look at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how the plans of Allah, He's making people realize that now this is a person who would bring you people together. He will stop you from having a war. And this is a person that all of you agreed at this point, As-Sadiq al-Ameen, most truthful and most trustworthy person. As Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came in, and they explained the whole situation to him, it was a big responsibility. And he knows the jahiliyyah. I mean, they will accept it now, later on he will be, he will have to hear a lot of things from them. Let's see, you favored those people, how come you didn't favor us, how come you didn't do it for us? And he has to live in the same community. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed him with the wisdom and understanding. He made such a, such a judgment and gave such a ruling that normally people cannot think of it. He said, bring a sheep. As they brought a long sheep, he with his own blessed hands put the black stone in that sheep. Now he said, each leader of one of these, of each clan, hold one of these corners of the sheep and start lifting it up. So all of these leaders started lifting that up as the black stone is in that sheep and they are lifting it up. When they got it to where it was supposed to go in that position at that level, then he himself with his own blessed hand picked it up and put it over there in its place. Subhanallah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at that time making the leaders of Quraysh work for him. They are lifting it for him. And then, making his prophet of Allah put the black stone in its place. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as he started looking around, seeing the situation of his people, he was seeing all these evils. Every evil is there in the community. And there is no way of treating it. How could a person fight the whole community? How can a person go against the whole uh, tribe and the clan and the, uh, uh, the society? The whole society is going in the same direction. 
but he cannot take it. Someone has to bring some changes there. Someone has to do something to stop these people from these evils. Adultery, stealing, robbery, drinking alcohol, taking people's wealth without their permission, misusing people's wealth, misbehaving with slaves, mistreating women. All of these things were very common. Burying their, daughter, their own daughters alive and fighting each other for minute things, having a war against other clans, I mean, things that were, you can very easily look at these things and say very childish things and at the same time things that are very bad. Cannot, you cannot allow these things to continue in the community. You cannot allow your people to be involved in these things. For how long are they going to be in that ignorance? But what can he do? People are worshipping idols. How to stop these people from idol worshipping? He tried his best. He's trying to talk to people, but no one can understand. So now... The only thing he could think of, let me just spend some time with my God, with myself and between me and my God. And therefore he started spending time in the cave of Hera. There was a cave about three miles away from Mecca. He started going over there and spending time over there. And that was the period when he really loved staying away from everyone. He did not want to talk to no one. He did not want to stay with anyone. He does not want to communicate with people. He doesn't like to be around people. Because of all the evils that he had seen in that society. And there is no way he can stop it. He has a concern. Something is telling him that do something about it. But what should I do now? What can I do? How can I do it? So now he is just spending time by himself with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As he started spending time over there, sometime he would see some very strange things. He is going towards the cave and he would hear someone calling him. Who is calling? He looks around. There is no one there. Again someone is calling him. And now he started watching carefully. And as he is walking... The rock is saying, Assalamu alaikum, ya Rasulullah. Sometime he's passing by a tree and the tree says, Assalamu alaikum, ya Rasulullah. He doesn't know what's going on. The tree is saying, Peace be on you, O Messenger of Allah. The rocks are calling him and calling him, Peace be on you, O Messenger of Allah. And this continued, and he started spending his time in that cave of Hera. What was he doing there? Of course, the main thing he was doing there, thinking about his creator. Thinking of how to fight that society and stop the society from all of those evils. Thinking of how can he worship that one that has created him and everyone else in the universe. How can he stop people from worshipping idols and objects? This, was what he, this is what he was doing over there until he received the Nabuwa in that cave. How and when, inshallah, we will talk about it in our next session. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa lisa'ir al-muslimina wal-muslimat wa akhiru da'wana. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin.